are definitely living in the last days of Earth's history. And more and more people are believing that. In fact, in the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, but the very first verse of the first chapter says that the book of Revelation is about things which must shortly come to pass. In fact, that phrase is even repeated in the last chapter of the book of Revelation. And my friends, this is good news. Why? because it means that Jesus Christ is coming soon to take us home. And we here at the Paradise Church are committed to help people to be ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Would you like to be ready? Well, that is why we're so glad you could join us today. And now let's see what God has for us from his word. You know, we've been doing a six-part series. This is part four called Sent from God or Why I Am a Seventh-day Adventist. Today is December 2nd and the time, so the fourth part is a time sent from God. You will remember that the first part was a man sent from God. And of course, that man was William Miller. And it says in Great Controversy 409, the scripture which above all others had been both the foundation and central pillar of the Advent faith was the declaration under 2,000 and 300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed, Daniel 8:14. And then part two was a answer sent from God, and we discovered that that answer to the great disappointment that occurred on July and October 2nd, 1844, was the now coming understanding of the sanctuary. And the subject of the sanctuary was the key which unlocked the mystery of the disappointment of 1844. It opened to view a complete system of truth, connected, harmonious, showing that God's hand had directed the great Advent movement and revealed present truth as it brought to light the position and the work of his people. And then part three was very interesting. We looked at a woman sent from God. And of course, when we look at the time prophecies in the Bible, the first one we find is the 120 days flood and Noah was the prophet of that time. And included in Genesis uh, also 15 was the 40 year sojourn. And at the end of those 400 years was Moses the prophet. In Genesis 41, we find the seven year drought predicted by Joseph and Joseph was the prophet at that time. In Numbers four, we discovered the 40 years wandering in the wilderness and Joshua was the prophet at the end of that period. And then in Jeremiah, we found the 70 years captivity and Ezra and Nehemiah were the prophet of, at the end of that time. And then in Daniel 4 was the seven years of insanity and Daniel was the prophet. And then in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, we found the 400 year probation and John the Baptist and Paul were present at the end. And now we come to the last and longest time prophecy in the Bible. It's the 2300 years judgment. And at the end of that period, there was a prophet and her name was Ellen White. And now today, part four is a time sent from God. Let us pray. Father, I wanna thank you for each and every person that's come this morning. 
allowing us the privilege to be here to worship you and to see this chain link by link that you put together over this church for the purpose of preparing people for your soon coming. And now, Lord, use me in a very special way to share these thoughts that you've given to me in spite of my faults and shortcomings. May everyone be blessed. And Father, we also pray pray for the Holy Spirit to bring the calming peace of heaven as we go through this topic. For certain, certainly Satan is angry. So blessed to this end, in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to know or meet Rachel Oaks. Later, Rachel Oaks Preston. Rachel Oaks was a Seventh-day Baptist who went to church, a Sunday church in Washington, New Hampshire, because her daughter taught the church school there, and though she kept the Sabbath, Seventh-day Baptist, she wanted the fellowship, which she didn't have except for a Sunday church. And the preacher, his name was Frederick Wheeler. And Frederick Wheeler, one day on Sunday, was having communion, and Rachel Oaks was there. And during his preparation for the communion service, he mentioned that God expects us to keep all of the commandments. Well, Rachel Oaks almost came out of her seat like a rocket, but she controlled herself and waited for some time until Pastor Wheeler came to visit her. And they sat in her front parlor, and she said, Pastor, I have something to talk to you about. Well, sister, what is it? Well, you know, when you made that statement during communion, I wanted to stand up and tell you to put the communion table away and cover it because you're not keeping all of the commandments. He went, well, Sister Oaks, um, what do you mean by that? She got out her Bible and she showed him the fourth commandment and said, you are not keeping the Sabbath which is the fourth commandment of the Decalogue. So Frederick Wheeler, I, I try to picture how he'd feel, you know, when, <laughs> when the pastor gets accosted for something he said or does. You know, you go through a range of emotions first before the Holy Spirit takes over. <laughs> and he thought, okay, I'm going to study this thing. This was 1844, folks, and from his own personal study, Frederick Wheeler was convicted that the Sabbath was, was correct, and in the Bible, he not only kept it, but he preached it to his church, and some of the people in his church accepted it, including, for those of you who know more about our history, the Farnsworth family in Washington, New Hampshire. Well. Brother Wheeler wrote a track, and a Thomas Pebble, who was a preacher, got a hold of that track, and he accepted the Sabbath and wrote a track. And I got that arrow because I could not find a picture of him. And a man named Captain Joseph Bates, another Sunday keeper, got a hold of the track that Thomas Pebble wrote and read and conv- was convicted that the Sabbath was correct, and he declared to keep it. By the way, Frederick Wheeler was the first Advent preacher to accept the Sabbath and keep the Sabbath. And now Joseph Bates is keeping the Sabbath. And Joseph Bates wrote a track on the Sabbath. And look who read that track. James and Ellen White. Now, I've already told this story before. I got to shorten it really tight here. I want you to know, if you remember correctly, that at that very time in which he wrote the track, 
Ellen White and James White thought J Joseph Bates was a very nice Christian man, but he doesn't know what he's talking about on the Sabbath. Meanwhile, Bates was thinking, you know, come to think of it, Ellen White really is a sweet Christian lady, but visions in this modern day, no way. Ellen and James White read Joseph Spate's track, and they accepted the Seventh-day Adventist. And now, the later, after the disappointment movement of the Seventh-day Adventists include a small group that began to grow who kept the Seventh-day Sabbath. Today, we are going to answer four questions. Number one, when was the Sabbath instituted? Number two, where did it go? Number three, why is it important? And number four, why I became a Seventh-day Adventist. Let's take a look at question number one. I invite you to take your Bible and turn to Genesis, the second chapter. We're going to read verses one through three as we look at the answer to the first question, where did the Sabbath come from? Okay, so go to the first book of the Bible, the second chapter in that book, and let's read the first three verses. Children, I want you to do the same thing. Get your Bibles out and open it to Genesis. Genesis, there's something very special, very important here that we want to look at. Okay, do you have it? Genesis 2, 1, 2, 3. Here's what it says. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because he rested from all the work which God had created and made. Now, I know you're all familiar with that, but let's notice three things. And by the way, we could go all over the map on this, but we'll really focus here and move right along to the, to the very point we want to get to. First of all, in Genesis 2, before, before there was ever sin, before there was ever a Jew... God rested on the seventh day, God blessed the seventh day, and God sanctified the seventh day. Amen. Amen. So, as we look for where the seventh day Sabbath came from, let's also go to Genesis 2. K.K. read us, or Genesis, uh, Exodus 20. K.K. already read to us this beautiful text, but let's look at it again one more time. Genesis, Exodus 20, verse 8. Come on, boys and girls, open your Bibles. Look what it says. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, your God. In it you shall not work. You nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within the gate. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is, and he rested on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and the Lord hallowed it. Hallowed means sanctified set it apart for special use. And so you see, by looking first at Genesis 2, we discovered it was instituted in the Garden of Eden before there was ever sin or a Jew, and it had to be reintroduced to the Jews who had just come out of 250 years of bondage in Egypt. It was totally 400 years, folks, but they were only slaves for 250 of those years. So I want you to notice, look at the origin of the Sabbath as we answer the first question. This is not a Jewish day. 
This is not a Jewish day. It never was. It was a gift from God to man in the Garden of Eden. And so, the answer to the first question, where did the Sabbath come from? It came from the beginning as Jesus finalized the act of creation. That's where it came from. And let me highlight one more time, there was no sin at this point, and there was no Jewish person at this point. Now let's look at number two. Question number two, where did the Sabbath go? Well, I want to make it easy for you. When we look at Daniel, the beautiful prophetic book of Daniel, in chapter 7, we are introduced to a series of powers, but the most distinct in there and the one dwelled upon the most is called the... Daniel 7, the little horn. That's right. On the tenth beast, which was Rome, had ten horns. And amongst the ten horns, a little one came up. And look what it said that this horn would do. By the way, there's ten things this horn would do. I'm just picking on one of them in particular. It says, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, comma, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, comma, and do what? Shall intend to change times and laws. So we want to know what power could possibly do such a thing as, you know, this is the context of prophecy, the book of Daniel, the prophet Daniel, he's writing this. When it says times and laws, we're not talking about secular laws, we're talking about God's law. I think that's pretty understandable, right? Well, I want you to take a look at this slide, even though I know you can't see it very well. I couldn't find one that was bigger. These are the Ten Commandments as found in Exodus 20. These are the Ten Commandments as found in every single catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. I want you to notice that because the Roman Catholic Church believes in idols, they decided to take the second commandment out of the Ten Commandments. You knew that, right? Come on. Did you know that? Okay, they took it out because that commandment stood there in their face and they worship idols. As a kid, I would kneel down in front of the statue of Mary, light a candle, pay some money, and pray. Not knowing any of this stuff. So they took it out. Well, what did they, you know, then it's not Ten Commandments. So what do we do? We'll take the tenth one and break it in half. You shall covet your neighbor's wife is nine, ten. You shall not, wait. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. <laughs> and you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. They cut it in half. But folks, I'm not done. For they took the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. And they moved it to number three and they wrote in their catechism, remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. And then, folks, here's what they did. They changed the Sabbath day from the seventh day of the week, which God instituted in the Garden of Eden before there ever was sin, and, he, and they changed it to Sunday, the church I belong to, the church my family belongs to, the church all my relatives belong to. In Daniel, it said the little horn will change, or I, I take that back. 
will think to change times and laws. Why is it worded that way? Because no matter what they do, how they write it, and how they publish it everywhere and all over, in our hearts we know the fourth commandment is the seventh day, not the first day of the week. Where did it go? The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Now, I quoted directly from Genesis 2 and also Exodus 20. Who does the Sabbath belong to? The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, instituted by Jesus. Quote, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it at the conclusion of creation, but was changed by the Roman Catholic Church to Sunday with no biblical authorities, and I don't know why I was going to add it, and all the Protestants follow suit. Where did it go? It went the way of man in his thinking. Number three, why is it so important? I really like this. Exodus 31, 13 says, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a what? A sign between me and you throughout your generation that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctified you. Now, I want you to know when we talk to our neighbors, our friends, other Christians who keep Sunday, they simply look at this and say, well, Moses was commanded to tell the Jews this. But see, before there was a Jew, it was instituted in the Garden of Eden. Okay, keep that solid in your mind. And what is the Sabbath between me and you? Between God and us? A sign. That's what it is. The Sabbath ends up being the seal of God. And the word in Greek is oath. In Hebrew is oath. A signal. Literally or figuratively as a flag. A beacon. A monument. An omen. A prodigy. Evidence. Etc. Mark, miracle, and sign, token. The Sabbath was instituted by God as a sign that we are his people and we believe that he is the creator. And so why is it important? That's one. Here's another. There's a picture of the seal of God. The seal of God is the fourth commandment. Why is it the fourth commandment of the Decalogue? Because it's the only one that tells us the name of God, the Lord your God, and what his title is. What is his title? Creator. And his territory is? Heaven and earth. Look at all the other Ten Commandments. This, was, this really impacted me when I sat where, well, no, if this was an evangelistic meeting, I could say, I sat where you sat. I come walking in here completely ignorant of the Bible. I sit down. They point this out to me. And I mean, I like never had heard that before. I never heard that God is the creator of heaven and earth. It is the seal of God. It is the seal of his authority. It is the seal of of his ownership of all of us. And so we look now also at Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbath to be a what? Sign, same Hebrew word, between them and me that they may know I am the Lord who sanctified them. And then in the same chapter, verse 20, hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign. There's that Hebrew word again, oath, between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. 
You know, when you sit and look and contemplate and eat, meditate on these texts, you begin to see how important and necessary that the Sabbath is. In spite of the fact that we are ridiculed, belittled, and argued with that we're legalists for teaching this. Well, I got more, so let's take a look at this. How important is it? Deuteronomy 5.14, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. But in Mark 2.28, the New Testament, it says, therefore, the Son of Man is also what? He is Lord of the Sabbath. If Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, then which day is Jesus Lord of? Sabbath. Not Sunday. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. Nowhere. And by the way, you can look at Matthew 12, 8, and you can look at Luke 6, 5, and all three places in the gospel they quote Jesus saying, therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath day. And, and Jesus happens to be, well, I'm not going to tell you yet. Here it is. Who created the worlds, folks? I heard one person. Okay, we'll see if you're right. Who created the world? John 1.1, 1, 1, the word was God. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing made that was made. Who is the creator? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the creator. Well, what did Jesus do after creating? Okay, we already looked at this in Genesis 2.2. 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from the work which he had done. Now, let me just stop for a second. And you must remember, I used John to show you, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word is Jesus. Jesus is God. When it says that God ended his work, it means Jesus ended his work because John under inspiration and Paul under inspiration and John, the revelator under revelation, distinctly tells us that Jesus was the active agent in creation. Amen. Well, Jesus was also something else. What was he? He was the redeemer who redeemed the worlds? Here is Revelation 5, 9. You are worthy, for you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Who is that referring to? Jesus. Jesus Christ is the Redeemer. What did Jesus do after, he re after redemption? Mark 16, 1. Now, when the Sabbath was passed... The women brought spices that they might come and anoint him, but the angel said, he is risen. Now, folks, let's look at a couple things here. First of all, this proves beyond a shadow of a doubt because Jesus was buried on Friday afternoon. Remember, they went, the religious leaders went to Pilate and said, hey, the Sabbath is coming break their legs because we got to get them off the cross. And that's when the, the centurion discovered Jesus had already died and, and poor Pilate couldn't believe it because that's a lingering death. But Jesus died. He died of a broken heart, folks. He didn't, he didn't die from blood loss or pain, although that would have killed anybody. He died of a broken heart. The very people he came to serve and save crucified him. Well, what did he do after redemption? He rested in the Sabbath day. And I want you to notice that in spite of how necessary it is to, to anoint or to prepare for death and burial, they had... Not, they didn't have enough time to do it before the sun set. 
And they honored the Sabbath day and waited till Sunday morning to come to do the burial preparation. That's how, how ingrained in the disciples' minds was the fourth commandment of the Decalogue. And so we find out that our Creator and our Redeemer rested on the Sabbath immediately following the work they did. Well, here's another one that's very gripping. I'm almost done now, by the way. Revelation 7-2 says, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom was granted to harm the earth and the sea, verse 3, underneath, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their forehead. So, these are the four angels holding back the windows of strife that don't let go until the very end. The very end is when the seal of God is dispersed to those who deserve it and not given to those who don't want it. And the seal of God happens to be the Sabbath. I want you to notice that that angel coming from the east tells them to hang on until we go through the whole crowd of earth and, and put the mark of those who keep God's Ten Commandments. How important is it? Well, the Sabbath was instituted by Jesus after creation. B, the Sabbath is a sign between him and us. C, the Sabbath is the seal of God. D, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. E, Jesus rested the Sabbath after creation and redemption. F, the final issue in the great controversy will be God's Sabbath law versus Sunday or man's law. That's it. That's how important it is. And folks, horrible pressure is going to be brought to bear upon us to conform to man's law, and they will tell us because God, you know, well, he understands it just in our society today, it won't work. By the way, I distinctly recently heard that from one of the famous Sunday-keeping preachers. It just doesn't work anymore. And then another great argument. Well, Jesus rose on Sunday. That's why we keep Sunday. <laughs> but God commanded the Sabbath. And then I hear this. Well, we're under the new covenant, not the old covenant, as if the new covenant has no law. Come on. Who here wants to live in a state, in a country, in a city that has no laws? You better not want to live there. It'll be total chaos, and that's what our society is today. So, question number four, why I became a Seventh-day Adventist? By the way, that's really not a question, is it? Take a look at that angel that comes from the east bringing the news of the fourth commandment. That's what also happened during 1844 movement. The Sabbath was brought back to the attention of the people and a group of people accepted it and the group of people grew and you're here because of them. I became a Seventh-day Adventist because it was slash is the only church that believes and teaches what the Bible says, and also because I found the truth that set me free from the world and myself and gives me peace and security. In other words, this church and its doctrines were established from the Bible. And so, folks, I want you to take heart we are honoring God by honoring his commandments. And how we honor his commandments is being 
were being inspected and watched by not only the neighbors and friends and relatives and people of our own house, but also by the angels in heaven. And so God sent a time for the benefit of his people so that they could show their loyalty and belief that he is the creator and he is the redeemer. And as Dana said in his call, in God we trust, not man. Well, let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for the challenge of the hour. We see that you sent a man, Lord, and he came and preached a a message that affected the whole world. And then you sent, Lord, an answer because there was a great disappointment and the answer gave peace and tranquility to all who found it. And then you sent a woman. You sent that woman to carry forward what others had discovered and help put the seal of approval of heaven. And then you sent a time. And that time is for our benefit to rest and recuperate from the battering we receive all week because maybe we don't go to the cooler at work and listen to the dirty jokes. We don't use languages like other people use. All all day long, Lord, there are things in this world that, that make us distinct if we hold fast to your commandments and also, in some eyes, make us the point and the focus of ridicule. Let us not back down, Lord. Please bless each person who's here. Help them to remain faithful to you above all else so that we can help others to know this too. And now dismiss us with your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I hope you enjoyed the biblical presentation that you just experienced. It's our intention here at the Paradise Seventh-day Adventist Church of making the Bible, God's Word, the center of our lives. And we invite you to do the very same thing. For there's nothing more powerful or important in these last days than the Word of God. So thank you for joining us today. And if you're ever in the neighborhood, we invite you to come and to join us for worship on any Sabbath. May God richly bless you and your family.